How's it going guys? My name's Sam and welcome back to Prep Medic. As you can see, I am not in my usual surroundings. I'm actually traveling for the channel, working on a project with the company. But until that video releases, I figured I'd take this time to show you guys how to improvise a couple life-saving pieces of medical equipment. So on this channel in the past, we've talked about a couple pieces of medical equipment a lot. And those are tourniquets, chest seals, packing gauze, and splints. And today on the channel, I wanna show you guys how to improvise this. If you don't have a commercial device out there, these are some techniques you can use to accomplish the same objective. I would like to point out that this should never be your plan A. Anybody that carries a strip of cloth in their first aid kit and a little stick saying, well, I'm just gonna do a makeshift tourniquet, I, I would not recommend that at all. In the Boston bombing, there were a lot of makeshift tourniquets applied, and what they found is that a vast majority of them were ineffective. Now you might be thinking, well, what's the problem with a tourniquet that's not 100% effective? And I'll tell you, so if you have a tourniquet that is not completely tight, is not occluding blood flow 100%, all you're actually doing is occluding the vascular return in the leg, not the arterial discharge. So you will still have bleeding from the artery, but now you've stopped any vascular return into the body, so they're not getting any of that blood back. And you can actually speed up blood loss. So it's really important that if you use this technique, you do it right. You know, the same thing goes for chest seals. Chest seals are actually pretty easy to make, but they take a lot of time. So all of these things I'm showing you, you should practice. You should make sure you're proficient in them if you foresee a situation where you might have to do it. You know, having this knowledge is something that's good, but you have to understand that there are limitations to it and plan A should always be a commercial device because quite frankly, they're more effective and they're quicker to apply. So let's start with tourniquets. So to make a makeshift tourniquet, you just need three things. And right here I have a cravat, which is a triangular bandage. It doesn't have to be this. It can be any kind of fabric and you're gonna need two strips. So this is just a cut up t-shirt that I'm gonna be using. And then you need something to act as a windlass. So I'm gonna be using my uh, X shears for this. However, this can be anything. This can be a stick, it can be a piece of silverware, uh, what have you. It just needs to be something that can have a lot of force exerted on it and not break. So to make a makeshift tourniquet, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take your main, most sturdy piece of cloth and you're gonna make sure it's pretty wide. You want this cloth kind of as wide as you can get it and put it over the arm or the leg that's bleeding. So you want it above the injury. So they're saying two to three inches above the injury site, just not over a joint. You're gonna wrap it around the leg and you're gonna tie just an over under knot right across the leg. We're gonna do it on the leg for this uh, scenario. Then you're gonna put your makeshift windlass inside that. You're gonna tie another knot on top of that and potentially a second one depending on how well that fabric's holding. Then you're gonna take your makeshift windlass and you're just gonna start turning it. It's the same concept as a softy wide or another uh, windless tourniquet that you can buy commercially. You're gonna turn that until blood flow stops. At that point, you need to hold that windless right there. You're gonna take the second piece of cloth and put it across and feed it through that windless. And what that's doing is that's keeping it from turning back and loosening all the way. Once you have that secure, make sure that all the blood flow is stopped. If it hasn't stopped completely, try tightening the windlass one or two more turns. If that's not working, prepare to put a second tourniquet on there. Now, ideally, I wouldn't even go for this technique. I would actually try to do wound packing first if you can. That's because it's gonna be a little bit more effective and it's a lot quicker. It takes time to set up a makeshift tourniquet. You know, if you don't have a cravat right here, it's gonna take time to get a t-shirt ready to do it. You can do it with a whole t-shirt, you can cut strips, but just be aware that those are all seconds wasted. So try to pack the wound first. And that brings me to the second thing we're gonna talk about for improvising. And this is the one thing that honestly you can improvise and it doesn't bother me at all. It's not gonna take you a whole lot more time. You can pack a wound with basically any kind of fabric. You know, you don't have to worry about it being sterile or anything like that. I get a lot of comments about like, oh, why aren't your gloves sterile on the ambulance? That's because nothing is sterile in the emergency environment. Whatever cut them was definitely not sterile. So it doesn't really matter what we're putting in the wound. They're probably going to get an infection and they're gonna get broad spectrum antibiotics regardless. 
So all we have to do is make sure that blood stops so that they can live long enough to get that infection and to get those antibiotics. So for the wound packing, just take anything you have and you can just pack the wound like normal, like you would with regular gauze. That's completely fine. All right, so the third thing we're gonna talk about today is going to be a chest seal. So the first thing you have to do when you come across somebody that has a sucking chest wound is have yourself or a bystander take their hand and put it on top of that injury. That's gonna form a very effective occlusive dressing. Keep in mind that if it's a bullet hole or penetrating trauma, make sure you're looking for an exit wound as well. Ideally, you're gonna have a bystander do that and that will give you time to set up your makeshift chest seal. So you can choose to make an improvised chest seal two different ways. Number one is you take the plastic bag and you're gonna tape all four sides down and put it on top of the wound. All that's doing is creating what's called an occlusive dressing, which means that it won't allow air in or out. Now the second way to do it is you can tape three sides and leave the third side that's facing down open. What this will create is a flutter valve. So in theory, if they start developing a tension pneumothorax, that tension won't be able to build because it will be released through that valve. That being said, there won't be any air that's able to come back into the lungs, so it's still accomplishing the objective. Now I will tell you that there's no science to support a vented chest seal over a non-vented chest seal. I've found non-vented chest seals tend to adhere over the wound a little bit better than a vented one, so that's what I opt to do. Just be aware if you do that and they start to develop signs of a tension pneumothorax, you can just lift one corner of that chest seal and burp it. All right, so the final piece of improvised medical equipment we're gonna talk about today are going to be splints. For this, all you need is some kind of brochure or magazine and either tape, some kind of fabric, or a pressure dressing of some kind. Now to do this, all you do is you take the magazine and you fold it into kind of a boat shape there. You take their arm, and for this example, we'll do a wrist, and you're gonna put it on their arm just like you would a SAM splint. Once that's up and it's bowed up, this will not be able to flex up and down, which makes it an ideal splint because it's also not something that's completely rigid like a stick or a board or something like that. After that, you're gonna take your tape or your fabric or pressure dressing and you're going to secure it above and below the injury site. You wanna make sure that if it's a joint injury, you are splinting the long bone above and below, and if it's a long bone, you're splinting the joint above and below. Obviously, this gets a little bit more complicated when it comes to elbows or ankles. However, most of the time, if you're improvising a splint, it's going to be for a wrist because that's one of the most commonly broken bones in the body. So I wanna drive this point home really quick. Improvising medical equipment should never be your plan A. This is your plan C or D. Ideally, you're going to have commercial devices that you can use because quite frankly, these are gonna be a lot quicker to use and they're gonna be a lot more effective for your patients. That being said, we might be in a situation where multiple uh, devices might need to be used or we've run out or we just didn't have something on us and we have to be able to think on our feet and intervene for that patient. So these are good skills to have. Just please, please, please practice them before you have to do it in the real world because that's gonna make all the difference for your patient. That's all I have for this video, guys. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below and I will see you next week.